Welcome to the Critical Patriot. Today, I have got a very special guest with me, Professor Marvin Weinbaum. He is the most senior Pakistan watcher in Washington, D.C. Currently, he is working as Director of Afghanistan and Pakistan Studies at the Middle East Institute. He has worked uh, with the State Department, and before that, he taught political science and international relations at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. He did his PhD from Columbia University, and Professor Steve Cohen was one of his best friends. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shakil. I wanted to know what is your prognosis and diagnosis for Pakistan? It seems that we are on a downhill journey and uh, our adversary, many people would call implacable enemy, India is on uh, upward trajectory. World Bank recently re issued a report which says that 40% of Pakistan's population is below the poverty line. And the figure for India is, is 15%. And we have the lowest uh, per capita income in South Asia. So what do you think is wrong with Pakistan? Well, as far as the world, excuse me, as the IMF is concerned in their recent statement, they say it is because of the entrenched interests in the military, the bureaucracy, of the business community. So they're, they're making the case that interests that are exist now are, are indeed profiting or at least are satisfied with the current situation and see no reason to change it uh, because to change it is to perhaps weaken their, their status, where we weaken their powers within the country. That, that's from the uh, IMF when they also announced the 40% figure for the poverty level. But don't you think they, they are being uh, less than enlightened in this regard? Because if the economy collapses, their interests would also collapse. Though they should make sure that the, the economy remains afloat. Yes, and their attitude is this, that we're too large to fall. If our economy collapsed, uh, which would lead perhaps to political, to a political, uh, almost political difficulties, instability, uh, which would lead to societal conflict and so on. Uh, this is something that the neighboring countries and the international community recognize a disaster for everybody. And so if Pakistan has been muddling through all these years, it somehow will continue to do so. They will keep it afloat. And it's going to be in the interest, of course, of these elites, as they see it, these elites to how make it work. So there's there's a sense here that look uh, alternative to what we have in our political system and our economic system. Nobody expects that anybody's going to come in and make kind of reforms that would be necessary to, to put the economy on better than it is. And then there is simply the weight. Pakistan has accumulated so much de debt now that it's hard to see how Pakistan comes out from within this. Right. Uh, and, uh, and that, as happens often, is banks will foreclose on a small loan, but not on large loans because they've got too much to lose. Unfortunately, Pakistan is, is very low on human development index, education index, health index. And as you probably know, 
25 million children, Pakistani children are out of school, which is uh, the largest number in at least in Asia. And 40% of uh, Pakistani children are facing stunted growth because they are not uh, getting enough uh, nourishing food. And some people would say that elite capture has taken place. Elite has captured institutions of the state. So do you think this elite believes that international community will not let Pakistan's economy collapse because it is a nuclear capable country? You know it because it's a nuclear uh, country. If it collapses, the real beneficiary will be the jihadis. I thrive in the chaos that would ensue. I might, might say also that Pakistan is unlikely to collapse politically, at least, as long as the military remains cohesive, as long as it remains intact. Uh, the military will, in the last analysis, step in and uh, perhaps be the glue that keeps it going still further. Uh, I don't have much faith that there's very much that the that the civilian government, the elected government can do. Uh, uh, it uh, it's tied itself up in, in you know in knots here. And uh, I don't see any kind of compromises here because I think that the necessary kind of compromises are something they're incapable of doing. Uh, so in the military says we are the saviors of Pakistan, and that usually refers to security issues involving the borders. Uh, but uh, the fact is that the military also has to look at the economy and say, and say as has, for example, as has the militaries elsewhere, say, look, we can't be powerful if what we're ruling over is a third-rate country. Uh, so that the military has to, has to ultimately address the economic issue. And they've been loath to do that because if they stepped in now, they would have to do so clearly extra constitutionally. And the military would have to uh, would have to take on the responsibility of all that has gone on wrongly in the economy. Uh, and they're loath to do that. But I think in the last analysis, if the situation deteriorates too far, the military will have no choice as it sees it, but to intervene directly and to take responsibility. Uh, and as far as some of the regional neighbors, that's okay. They would have no problem with that because like all countries in the international community, we wanna deal with those who can make decisions, including the tough decisions. By the way, I think that the kind of instability that we're talking about for Pakistan, economically, politically, socially, and so on, is not to India's benefit either. And I think the Indians know that. They have to know that. The last thing they want to see is a, a Pakistan that's out of control, that nobody controls. Of course, as I said just a moment ago, it will be the extremists, the militants, who will thrive in that kind of environment. Yeah, I actually uh, was listening to an Indian uh, ambassador, retired ambassador, and he actually argued that uh, we should not gloat over the fact that Pakistan is about to uh, disintegrate into four pieces. It will be a bigger headache for India if it uh, it, it gets divided yeah. into four yeah. parts. Yeah, no, but it's, it's exactly the military which will keep that kind of fracturing from taking place. 
After all, after Bangladesh, after 1971, if the military stands for anything, it is the integrity of the state, the, the physical integrity of the state, geographical. So uh, although there, and Pakistan, I don't think divides very easily. Yes, Baluchistan, yes, uh, but Sin cannot exist without the rest of Pakistan. Certainly the Punjab cannot exist without the rest of Pakistan. So I don't I don't see that that happening. Uh, but don't you think Pakistan needs to redefine security and it should uh, include human security and economic security also? It's not just defense. Yeah, I think there's more really it's taken a long time for elites to to recognize that that their their position is not secure if they ignore the inequality inequalities in the society they don't know what to do about it is the problem i think there's the recognition that there is there is this vulnerability uh, but the the answer is not very clear. Uh, uh, but how, how does Pakistan grow its economy? Given the fact that particularly the, the debt obligations are what they are, it doesn't have the resources, I think, to be able to do very much here. Uh, it, it would require the uh, enormous concessions on the part of the entire loan community to put Pakistan on its feet where it could really imagine it's, it's writing the things that have gone so wrong. What is the view of the government and Pakistan watchers in Washington, D.C.? You have some uh, eminent people in, in this community, uh, for example, Mike Kugelman, Daniel Markey, so, and there are some others also. What, what oh, yeah. is their view? You know, what, what should Pakistan do? Does it need to redefine its foreign policy? Does it need a paradigm shift and have relations, better relations with India? Well, I think they've got the community here. Uh, I wouldn't say it speaks with one voice, but there is a good deal of consensus here among those. And we have a large number, I think, of what we call Pakistan watchers, Afghanistan Pakistan watchers here. And it's it's a, it's it's I think it's a very it's a very well informed and linically very strong community, uh, and yes, they have always felt that uh, there had to be some rapprochement between the two countries. Uh, this is necessary, uh, but that's not what's holding Pakistan back right now. Uh, this. Clearly, there is not going to be an easy, any solution, perhaps, to India-Pakistan problems. Um, now that Modi has removed, in effect, Kashmir from, from negotiations, uh, it, it's, uh, it's hard to see this. Uh, most of the concentration on international affairs has been, where does Pakistan come down vis-a-vis -vis China? U.S. Uh, most recently, Ukraine enters the picture. Given given this, uh, actually, I think that there is a, a goodly amount of understanding of Pakistan's position that China has things to offer Pakistan that the United States cannot or would not. Similarly, the United States has resources and, uh, and connections, particularly with respect here to the trade between Pakistan and the United States that China cannot offer. Uh, China cannot be the trading partner or Russia that the United States is. That Pakistan has to strike some balance here between the two countries. Uh, China and, and U.S. in particular, and, and find a, a way to navigate here 
among the great powers, although the feeling is ultimately that the U.S. would be the most important country for, for Pakistan's position. As far as the domestic situation, there has long been a sense here that unless Pakistan's elected representatives were prepared to get serious about the economy in restructuring, particularly for the revenue stream that the country denies itself on property and agriculture, uh, that no country can be solvent, which which is so unprogressive in that sense in its in its system of taxation. Right, uh, you you have been visiting Pakistan since 1974, and you know quite a few important people in Pakistan. So, what is your your sense? Do they realize? For example, Pakistani academics, Pakistani diplomats, Pakistani think tankers, do they realize that there is a need for uh, a fundamental change, paradigm shift in the direction of foreign policy and domestic policy? Well, again, foreign policy, I don't think they expect any, any paradigm change here. Uh, there, there's not room for change. Uh, there was the overtures that were made and continue to be made on a low level between Mos Mos to Mount Moscow. Uh, that was worrisome to the policymakers here uh, because uh, it's taken together with what Imran Khan was saying about the conspiracy against him. That was that was a particularly low point. And that's past. That's past now. Uh, now, most of the consensus here would be that Pakistan has to take the bull by the horns here. Uh, how how we can go about doing this, it's hard to see. Say, there, are, there are some who say, uh, as important as democracy is, uh, this democracy has not delivered. Uh, it democracy uh, works only if the participating interests are able to work with one another, are, are able to reach compromises. But Pakistan is a win-and-take-all system in many respects. Uh, I win, you lose. You lose, I win. Unfortunately, the United States seems to be also heading in that direction. But it still has strong enough institutions which retard that kind of progression. For a long time, as everybody recognizes, the U.S. saw Pakistan through the prism of Afghanistan and its needs in Afghanistan. A small portion of that still remains, but basically now the U.S. has to see Pakistan on its own terms. And that's not hard to do. After all, as we've said, Pakistan is a nuclear armed country. Uh, Pakistan also plays a major role in the containment here of international terrorist groups. Uh, uh, any kind of conflict between India and Pakistan could have enormous regional and international implications. Uh, even without nuclear exchange. Uh, so, and there's so much now going on vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf. The Gulf has gotten into this in, in a way also. The Gulf needs stability. Professor Weinbaum, how far do the Americans blame Pakistan for unceremonious uh, exit from Afghanistan? Well, look, it has held Pakistan possible for the survival of the Taliban for 20 plus years now, 20, 22 years. Uh, and uh, I don't think that that figures very importantly right now. Right now, the U.S. 
could use Pakistan in order to better understand Afghanistan and to put some pressure on, on Kabul. What has been recognized very clearly now is that Pakistan does that kind of influence. We've always assumed here that Pakistan, whatever Pakistan wanted is what the Afghan Taliban did. And it, it was a wrong assumption. It always was a wrong assumption. But that was the, was the mindset uh, set that it's all about what Pakistan is. I think we've come to realize that that problem was never the case, but it certainly is not the case now. And of course, meanwhile, Pakistan has recognized that its expectations for Afghanistan were all wrong. It should have recognized that as it happened in 1997, once the Taliban took control, they would stand for any kind of orders being handed down from Pakistan, from the security in Pakistan. Uh, and so every there's been a rude awakening here uh, on that score. May I have your, your concluding thoughts, sir? What would you advise uh, to the government of Pakistan, the Pakistani elite, and maybe the Indian government? Look, I don't know what has, hasn't been said because it's all been said. Uh, but Sometimes even when people understand fully what the diagnosis, finding the prescription is another matter. Sometimes we are very keen in our analysis of, of what's wrong and very, very inadequate in our ability to come up with solutions. Solutions that are realistic, solutions that that uh, that can be delivered, uh, and that's where we are here. Uh, I think we we have we have the the diagnosis in large part. Operationalizing that would mean that people would have to take risks and make sacrifices. I emphasize take sacrifices. Uh, it's hard to get people who are comfortable with the way things are to say, we're going to have to take some risks. And so I thought, I'm not optimistic. On the other hand, I don't think Pakistan's going to fail as a state. As I say, it can't. It can't, for its own sake and for others, can't fail, uh, which means what all that's left here are bandages. It means it means muddling through the term that we've used for the longest time as to how Pakistan somehow continues in the game. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Weinbaum, although the quality of uh, internet seems to be a little weak. But uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts. My pleasure.